In the previous episode, we visited some of the more touristy parts of St. Louis. Today, we're going to see some of the historic sites, most of them related to the Lewis and Clark expedition, such as Camp Du Bois, where Lewis and Clark spent the winter of 1803 to 1804 preparing for the historic expedition. We'll visit the Confluence Tower, from where you can see the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers, not to mention downtown St. Louis almost 15 miles away. We'll climb to the top of Monk's Mound in the Cahokia Mounds, from where you can also see the iconic downtown. We'll backtrack to Chester, home of Popeye, and another Lewis and Clark historic site, the old Cahokia Courthouse, and Fort Kaskaskia, what's left of it anyway. We'll go see William Clark's final resting place. Also, St. Charles, Missouri's first capital, and Jefferson City, Missouri's present-day capital, as we make our way to yet another great American city. Kansas City, that is. I'm free in my RV, yeah. Well, here we are at the Lewis and Clark State Historic Site. I believe this is uh, Camp uh, Du Bois. Let's just check it out. Here we go. And we are here. Camp River Du Bois. It turns out, by many accounts, this is the true beginning of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Meriwether Lewis wrote it himself on May 14, 1804. And at 4 o'clock that same day, they departed on the great adventure. It was here where they spent the winter of 1803 to 1804, gathering supplies and recruiting men for the long journey. So we've been to Monticello, D.C., Harpers Ferry, Pittsburgh, and uh, we've been pretty much following this Big Bone Lick, Cincinnati, Fort Massac, and now we're here at Camp Du Bois, from where we're gonna take the, the Missouri River. Well, they have a life-size replica of the keelboat, one of many I'm sure we'll see along the way. This one is actually a cutout, so we can see what it was like inside. Amazing how they maximized the limited space, with not an inch to spare in certain areas. Here we have some instruments, the all-important whiskey, and I imagine where the captains would sleep. The fiddle, I imagine, would have belonged to Private Pierre Crusat, who spoke both French and Omaha, and of course, played the fiddle. So many things to pack. Weapons, food, medicine, trinkets to give the Native Americans, and also things to trade for extra food, and eventually even horses when they got to the mountains. So this is uh, where they wintered from 1803 to May 1804 and that's when they finally departed. Yeah, let's go check out the fort real quick and then we'll continue towards the Confluence Tower. The reason this is considered the true beginning of the trail, even though it has recently been extended back to Pittsburgh, 
is because here's where they would really begin the journey into the unknown, cut off from the known world. This is where they would enter the recently acquired Louisiana Territory, a huge piece of land that stretched from the Mississippi all the way to the Rockies, essentially doubling the size of the United States. Up until now, everything had been more or less mapped. Also, the man who left from here on May 14, 1804, was exactly the same crew that would make it all the way to the Pacific, minus one death, that of Sergeant Floyd, and the addition of Sacagawea, Charbonneau and their infant son Baptiste the following winter. The reconstructed fort is unfortunately in a little bit of disrepair, so we can't go inside the structures, but at least they have pictures to show us what it would have looked like inside. Yeah, apparently the camp itself is in not very good shape. She said that they've had some termite problems. <laughs> so, yeah. But it was a real treat to see the kill boat and how it was uh, packed for the long journey. And it was it's larger than, than I thought. And I have a feeling this is going to be just one of a few replicas we're going to see along the trip. I want to thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode and share with you the amazing benefits of Magic Spoon cereal. Cereal reinvented, yet never boring, with tasty flavors that are actually good for you. The main thing here is high protein, low carb and zero sugar, except for the honey nut that has only one gram, I mean that's nothing. It is also keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free and did I mention low carb? Yeah, with no artificial colors or sweeteners. Let's give it a taste test. Today I'm trying the salty caramel flavor. I've never actually had this one before and it even smells good. Hmm. Hmm. Let me tell you, I've been trying to cut down on carbs, sugar, unhealthy food, and this is a perfect way to start my day. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can have a four pack or a six pack or build your very own variety box and use my code TRAVELING for $5 off. Uh, this week we got, what did we get? Frosted um, apple cinnamon. I don't believe I had this one before either. Uh, that that uh, salted caramel, cocoa, fruity and peanut butter. You can also add cereal bars to your variety box, by the way. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code TRAVELING for $5 off, or, or go to magicspoon.com slash traveling to get $5 off your order today. The Confluence Tower is less than a mile north as the crow flies, but first, let's go down to the river real quick. And here's another view at Camp River Du Bois. I don't think there's a whole lot to see down here, except for the fact that Lewis and Clark themselves and their crew may have walked along this east bank of the river many times during their stay here. Although chances are the river has changed course since then, as rivers do. There it is, the Confluence Tower. Here we have some more interpretive signs, and there's really no one else here. As we approach, we are greeted by Lewis and Clark. Lewis in charge of cataloging plants and animals they would find. Clark would make the maps. And it is. At that tip of the island yeah, over there? That would be the That's Missouri where the, that's where the, the Missouri is coming into the Mississippi, correct. Here's looking back at St. Louis, almost 15 miles away, and the very spot where the two longest rivers in the United States meet, the Missouri and the Mississippi. There's an RV park and the guide told us that it's mostly refinery workers and that would be the Wood River Refinery, one of the largest in the Midwest. Thousand Square Foot Museum. Today's explorers stroll along a full-size cutaway replica 
of the Lewis and Clark Expedition Cuba. We've decided to drive all the way to the confluence. There seems to be a short trail. This, by the way, not part of the original plan today, but I thought it would be a good way to end our action-packed day. And then tomorrow we'll continue exploring. This would be the Clark Bridge spanning the Mississippi. And if we were to continue driving on US 67, we would cross the Lewis Bridge spanning the Missouri. How appropriate. It is a pretty long dirt road to get to the confluence, but we're already here. Well, this right here is that little peninsula we saw uh, from the tower. Actually, I can see the tower from here. <laughs> uh, that is the actual confluence of the Missouri at the Mississippi. And there's a short trail that we're gonna do. Yeah, the Missouri meets the Mississippi. Look who's here, Lewis and Clark. The painting depicts the expedition camping at Tavern Creek, about 51 miles up the meandering stream. Let's go, it should be a 0.3 mile one way, estimated hiking time, nine minutes. That was really cool, I just met up with some viewers there. And uh, yeah, we have a, a lot of viewers in the Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky area for sure. Yeah, we're almost there, we're almost at the confluence. Here's looking downstream, south, at the combined waters of the two rivers. And here we are. Missouri River. Muddy here. Oh shoot. Ah. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm thinking the water is perhaps a little higher than normal here. From here, of course, we can see the confluence tower. Incredibly, it took us over half an hour to drive from there to here, but I think it was worth it. Tell you what, since we can't even read the interpretive signs, I'm gonna go back to the trailhead and fly the drone. Fascinating to see the very distinct waters of the two rivers mix. The Missouri even muddier than the Mississippi, if that can even be possible, carrying sediment and other debris all the way from Montana. Isn't that amazing? Of course, once again, that would be St. Louis in the distance. Back to St. Louis we go. Tomorrow will be another day. Another day of exploration.
Well, good morning. We're gonna have a slight change of plans here because we've got bad weather coming. And um, I did make a reservation uh, for the arch for today at 1 p.m. or is it 1 or 3 p.m.? Regardless, it's gonna be the, the, the time where we have the worst weather prediction, like 100% rain and whatnot. So the arch would, wouldn't be good, right? With rain. So we're gonna try, try to change that uh, reservation. So before Head the west on Bogey Avenue toward Continental Green Road. So before make a U-turn. She doesn't know where we're going. Hey, so before the rain begins, let's go see Cahokia Mounds and uh, whatever else we I, I, we can get to see before the rain begins, which is gonna begin like I don't know in about an hour or two. Luckily, we're kind of close to it here, so. In 1,000 feet, turn right onto Continental Grain Road. Yeah, I'm gonna turn to Cahokia Mounds and Cahokia Courthouse this morning. I'm, I have to go buy some soap. We run out of soap. It happens. <laughs> There's a reason why St. Louis is often called Mound City, and that is because of all the Indian mounds in the surrounding area. And Cahokia Mounds, where we're going, is the oldest prehistoric Native American site north of Mexico dating back to around 700 A.D. Ooh, we've got some menacing clouds lurking all around us. Here we are. Well, the Cahokia Mounds Visitor Center across the road is temporarily closed, but here we have Monk's Mound. Monk's Mound, <laughs> I can't pronounce this morning. And this one, you're allowed to climb. Uh, so, yeah. Lightning, danger on mound during stormy weather, so we must hurry because stormy weather is coming, that's for sure. Uh, there's brochures and trail maps. Okay, here we go. City of the Sun. So that's what it would have, would have, would have looked like. Right, let's go up to the top of the mound. The visitor center is closed and so is the road to it, so we're gonna have to walk over there. That's a pretty tall mound. Is it this one the tallest mound in the United States? Could be. Yep, I consulted the Book of Knowledge, and it is the largest man-made earthen mound in the North American continent. The more you know. Yeah, we've got bad weather spawning all around us. Well, here we are. We've made it to the top. You can see St. Louis over there. It's getting pretty windy up here, which is a clear sign of bad weather coming. But still, you know, I want to be able to, to explore up here a little bit. We can see the stockade next to the parking lot. Well, I think the, the prudent thing to do would, would be to get back down. looking down there looking at the trail map which isn't that great and uh, yeah apparently this is the only mound that you can climb to the top of so it's pretty cool a 
let's see if we can walk across the street and see those other mounds even though the visitor center is closed and uh, before it starts raining it's supposed to start raining in about an hour so we have a little bit of time left okay Woodhenge that's one mile that way a little bit very nice network of trails here and uh, I've seen a lot of locals you know just just using these trails for for exercise and whatnot. I don't think this is an official crosswalk, but we're gonna do it anyway. Grand Plaza. In any case, this is that grand plaza they're talking about in that display. And uh, I wonder how do they know exactly, uh, you know, what transpired here so many years ago, but I guess archaeologists do, right? There's another mound over there. Let me download that app. That would be cool. It's very, very cool. So it shows what it would look like. Oh, that's very very cool that app is really cool uh, probably worth the the was it 5.99 or 4.99 i think 5.99 that i paid for it <laughs> and then you, you you scan each one of these uh, signs around the trail and it shows you you know you can travel back through time and see an augmented reality a version of all this there's a slider on the bottom that you can move and change uh, time periods. All the way to the left, you can't even see the present day trees. And you see everything exactly how we would have, it would have been back in the day. So this would have been a village right here. Oh, look at all the people. Well, that, that part is not that well made, but the rest is. Been the stockade. But in reality, would have gone all around the place. Oh, look at that. All right, let's continue. Let's go back to the parking lot and let's see if we can visit that Woodhenge. And then that's it for this morning. It's gonna rain probably most of the afternoon the only thing I regret when I went up there I didn't have the app yet so there are a couple of you know augmented reality tours up there that I, I would have liked to see okay so this is what the stockade would have looked like apparently are you allowed in here I suppose This it looks like a much more modern material, if you, if you ask me. So, and they have modern bolts, so. <laughs> All right, let's continue. There's another structure called Woodhenge, about a mile west of here. Let's see what it is all about.
This is one of five circular sun calendars found by archaeologists in this area. This is it, the Woodhenge. A prehistoric solar calendar. That's what it would have looked like back in the day. And this is the reconstruction. Well, Woodhenge there. A little anticlimactic, I'll be honest about it. I understand that uh, I was expecting something more grandiose and it's just a bunch of very carefully measured uh, sticks on the ground, basically. You know, exactly positioned to, to match the solstice and the equinox and whatnot. So, very cool. But expectations are a funny thing, aren't they? All right, I'm gonna turn off the camera now. I gotta go buy some supplies, you know, some groceries, and then we'll reconvene this afternoon. So I came back to the RV park, waited out the storm, and now we're going to backtrack and go back to a couple of places we missed on the way here. This is the first one, the old Cahokia Courthouse, originally built by the French in 1740. And while the Court of Discovery were at Camp River Du Bois, Lewis and Clark used the courthouse as their headquarters. From here, they collected information, met with territorial leaders, gathered supplies, and corresponded with President Thomas Jefferson. Unfortunately, it is closed today, because it would have been really cool to see all the exhibits inside. Well, it's a real bummer that it, that it is closed, but uh, at least we got to see it from the outside. The, the old Cahokia courthouse. Now, we have a couple more points of interest. They're a little bit of a drive, but it's gonna be fun. Stray dogs, hmm, that's something you don't really see every day. Uh, at least not anymore. Well, if a little rain didn't stop Lewis and Clark, it is not gonna stop me either, right? So this is the site of Fort Kaskaskia or Kaskaskia. We are not certain of Fort Kaskaskia's appearance. This artist's conception showing the fort under construction is based upon archaeology and descriptions. So no, no one bothered to take a picture back in the day. <laughs> yeah, photography wasn't invented yet. But that could be a painting. Uh, here we go. So here's our uh, Lewis and Clark connection. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson. Apparently, they recruited 12 men here, more than at any other place along the route. This would be the Garrison Hill Cemetery. In 1881, there was a great flood, which changed the course of the Mississippi River, flooding much of the town of Kaskaskia. It actually became an island. 300 graves in the village were exhumed, and the remains were buried atop this bluff. Oh, by the way, if you're looking for Fort Kaskaskia anywhere, it no longer exists. Only earthworks and some artifacts remain.
By the way, a lot of these signs here were erected for the uh, 200th anniversary, erected in, in 2003. So that will be the, uh, the anniversary of the trip. And uh, I'll be brief because it is starting to rain here a little hard again. Uh, this is uh, where, you know, you can imagine uh, Lewis and Clark coming on the kill boat and the two pirogues. And here they recruited 11 more men and, it's, and got a second pirogue and uh, a third pirogue, I'd rather. And uh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we backtracked to this place because we had skipped it after Cairo a couple of days ago. Yeah, I came to this shelter, by the way, very nice state park as far as state parks go. This one is nice. They have a campground, dump station. Oh, let me get back to the car. Yeah, they have a pretty decent campground here, so maybe one of these days. Now we've got one more stop, perhaps our last point of interest in the state of Illinois. And wouldn't it be cool if a train came roaring by right now? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chester, Illinois. Well, here we are in famous Chester, Illinois. Not only famous because Lewis and Clark were here, it's famous because of Popeye. In my opinion, not the prettiest statue in the world, especially for a cartoon character, but hey, at least he got one. Well, yeah, this is the birthplace of the creator of Popeye. Uh, morning, 1894. Had we delayed by one minute or two, we would have seen this train going by. Timing is everything, although this is not a bad view. Yeah, we have a very loud train going north here. Oh, it's gone. Louis and Clark would have been coming upstream here at a much, much slower pace. And uh, just to prove that Louis and Clark were here, they have a display. I don't know if they stopped here, maybe they did. But, um, there they are. On November 27, 1803, Meriwether Lewis, William Clark and their party camped on Horse Island, just opposite this place at the confluence of the Kaskaskia and the Mississippi Rivers. The next morning, Lewis left them to travel by land. Clark and the men pushed onto Kaskaskia via the Mississippi River. There you go. Anyhow, what well, took us merely, merely 11 minutes driving took them probably whole day or more. And here we have, of course, a welcome to Illinois sign because on that other side of the river, that would be Mississippi, but check it out. Here they have the sign. Welcome to Chester, home of Popeye. <laughs> We're making my famous beer beef stew, or a variation of it, since it never comes out exactly the same. If this butter ever melts. We're going to brown the meat first, as you do. Salt. And pepper. A little more salt and pepper and now we're going to add the beer one of the ones we got at the meetup at rockwell beer company here in st louis and now we're gonna let it simmer there for about an hour huh. 
How about some celery? Yeah, carrots too. And potatoes, gotta have potatoes. Green pepper. Now for the good part, smoked paprika. Oregano, a bay leaf, and just a little bit of cumin. Green peas, and I just remembered, let's chop an onion for good measure. Let's do garlic. Lots of garlic. Finally, let's add a little bit of hot sauce to give it a little kick. I think this is ready. Just another lazy morning, not so lazy, at the RV park. Our first stop today is going to be the Bellefontaine Cemetery, which is very historic on its own right. It is home to many works of funerary art, some listed in the National Registry of Historic Places, but let's face it, today we're looking for a very particular grave perhaps the most important of them all, especially when it comes to the scope of our current series, and that is William Clark's final resting place. They do give you a map at the visitor center, so it should be relatively easy to find. Here we are. Here he is, William Clark, and as you probably know, earlier this year we visited the final resting place of Meriwether Lewis, Clark's counterpart in the Corps of Discovery, and today we're visiting Clark right here in St. Louis, Missouri, at the place where, where the expedition really started. Actually, right now we're going to the place where the, where the expedition really started, which is St. Charles, Missouri but uh, that's where we're going next. And uh, according to what I read across uh, the lot here, they have some of the plants that cataloged and uh, discovered by, by, by Lewis and Clark, but I think the garden is kind of under construction. Let's check it out. This is it. These are some of the plants brought back from the expedition.
Alright. Let's continue. Let's take one final look here and it is worth noticing the square and compasses symbol, which means that Clark was a Freemason, inducted in 1809 into the St. Louis Lodge. It is a beautiful cemetery and very easy to get lost in its endless maze of winding narrow roads, but I'm confident eventually we'll find the exit. Now, let's go to St. Charles. On May 16th, 1804, two days after departure, the expedition arrived in St. Charles, a village founded in 1769, mostly inhabited by French Canadians, which would later become Missouri's first capital. Lewis had remained behind tying some loose ends and wouldn't arrive until May 20th. Here in St. Charles, he hired two more translators, Pierre Crusat, who also played the fiddle, and one Francis Labiche. Now, there's supposed to be a very good museum here. They even have a replica of the keelboat, so let's check it out. Here we are, and we've even got seamen to greet us. <laughs> Unfortunately, the keelboat is behind bars in this warehouse, so it is kind of hard to appreciate. But it does seem to be a seaworthy full-size replica. Let's step into the museum. On May 21st, some of the men attended one final mass, and at 3.30 p.m. the expedition set out completely cutting themselves off from civilization. There would be no more incoming letters, no orders, no commissions, no fresh supplies, no reinforcements. Nothing would be able to reach them until they returned. They were as autonomous as Columbus, Magellan or Cook were in their time, sailing into the unknown. The dioramas are a little crude, but very effective in retelling the story of the expedition. From the death of Sergeant Floyd, to their encounter with the Teton Sioux, which almost put an end to the journey, to wintering among the Mandan, encounters with Grizzly Bear, the near capsizing of the boat, the Great Falls of the Missouri, their encounter with the Shoshone, and the almost unsurpassable obstacle that were the Rocky Mountains. As we continue traveling west, we'll be able to see all this in present-day America. Until ocean in view, oh the joy! Here are some of the specimens they may have encountered. Sacagawea, perhaps? Check out the medical instruments of the era. Oh no, that's a scary-looking syringe. There was no way to buy any medications, so they had to bring them all with them. The canoes they would have to build, actually, along the way. As remote as they were going, Parts of the river had already been mapped, at least until the Mandan villages in present-day North Dakota, where they were planning to spend the winter. Of course, we have windows from where we can see the mighty Missouri. And here's again the keelboat from a different vantage point. Let's walk around Frontier Park a little bit. There's supposed to be a Lewis and Clark monument somewhere around here. Hello, fellas. Don't go away. I 
guess they don't like me. They left. All kinds of wildlife. And we're not even in the Wild West yet. There's a lot of pollen in the air here in late spring. And even though it looks very pleasant, it is actually rather warm, for early June, that is. And here's the aforementioned statue of Lewis, Clark and Lewis's Newfoundland seamen. As we travel farther west, we might start seeing statues that also include Sacagawea, who was their Shoshone guide and translator and certain Native American chiefs, but it's too early in the trip for that. Also, hard to fathom how young they were at the time, 29 and 33 respectively, and they had such a monumental responsibility. Now let's explore St. Charles a little bit and look for that historic capital building. Before we continue, it is really hot, so let's check out the local saloon. There is a Lewis and Clark restaurant we want to check out later, but it might be closed today. So we're gonna eat at Lewis and Clark's restaurant, but it is closed on Tuesday. Here we are, first Missouri State Capitol, which seems to be this building under construction. The visitor center was about to close, so they weren't very helpful. Remember how we couldn't find anything about Lewis and Clark in Washington, D.C.? Here, they're everywhere. Well, unfortunately, they don't have any more tours today, but we're free to roam back here. And the capital would be that building back there, I'm assuming, right? It's the only one that looks like old. Yeah, apparently this is the capital building. At least that's what it looks like. Well, unfortunately, there's, there's not a whole lot of information. And it's not that, like they were very willing to give it in there, so they, they're kind of like, I think they want to go home. So yeah, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to show you anything about the, the, the old state capital. This building is there, but they're not, not offering any more tours today. They didn't seem very willing to you know, give out any information. I mean, it is what it is. There seems to be a garden back here. And uh, we'll continue. I think we're gonna go back to St. Louis soon. Some ruins here. What can I say? St. Charles was a little bit of a disappointment. The museum was good, but then again, the kill boat could have been displayed in a more suitable manner. The statue was great to see. The saloon was actually pretty good, but we weren't in the mood for bar food. And the Lewis and Clark restaurant was closed on the one day we decided to come. And then the first capital, all under construction. I mean, don't get me wrong, it is a charming downtown, but we were not feeling it this time. We might come back someday and give it a second chance. For all we know, there might have been a surprise around the corner. But right now, we're going back to St. Louis, we're going to visit the cathedral and the arch, but you already saw that on the previous episode, so we'll reconvene tomorrow as we continue driving to the west. Today we're going to Kansas City, the great city in the middle of the country. Um, this RV park, by the way, convenient, impeccably located right across the, the, the river from downtown is St. Louis. I'm making time here so this thing uh, wakes up. And um, the only negative is these sites are incredibly short here on this side of the RV park. And it is it's kind of a sketchy part of town. 
a lot of urban blight and, and all that in this area east st louis but other than that if if, if all you want to see is the the i mean some sites on the other side you can see the arch from your from your rv so now we have a two hour drive to to the missouri state capital jefferson city and then about another hour or two where we're gonna stay tonight Crossing the mighty Mississippi and from this day forth we'll be west of the Mississippi for a while hopefully Yeah, we're taking a little bit of a scenic drive here in order to stop at places like this and maybe get a view or at least a glimpse of the Missouri River. We're not in much of a hurry. Besides, there's a winery which everybody recommended at the St. Louis meetup that we want to check out. This road, State Route 94, goes almost parallel to the Katy Trail, which we may want to walk a section of one of these days. It is definitely a welcome change of scenery from the interstate. You know, the way we travel, you know, we have a plan and there are places that are, par are part of the plan. And then there are places like this that you find out about them along the way. And you visit them briefly. And, you know, we, uh, we, we actually we got a bottle of wine and, you know, it, 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 it's blocking our exit and, uh, and all that. <laughs> and... Uh, we mark them on the map because we want to return here someday. This place is beautiful. Great, great service inside. And look at the view. It's like amazing. We figured it is too early for a tasting, right? Besides, we still have several miles ahead of us today. So we decided to just buy a bottle, you know, for tonight. We can see the river all the way from here. Somewhere around here was a settlement called La Charette, at the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition, the last settlement of whites on the river. Here they got some eggs and milk and continued the journey, going deeper and deeper into Native American territory, which was possibly hostile in nature. They did encounter several fur traders going downstream, but that was about it. We're crossing the Missouri once again, which we are going to cross many more times during our journey to the west. Now arriving at the state capital, Jefferson City. Actually, I think this is the side of the building. Let's drive all the way around to the front. Yep, this is the spot from where to take the picture. 
maybe we can go around. There's of course a statue of Thomas Jefferson, who gives the city its name. The sculpture represents the Mississippi, father of waters. This one, the Missouri. Bronze statue at the top is that of Ceres, the Roman goddess of agriculture. Well, yes, here we are at the capital of the Show Me State, and that will be Jefferson City, Missouri. And that's the Capitol building right there. I thought it would be a good idea to stop real quick. I mean, it was kind of along the way. We're not going to have time to like tour the grounds or the building itself, at least not today. I mean, we are kind of illegally parked right there. Not illegally, but I'm taking a little more than two spots. They're very small spots, you know, parking spots, but, you know, just a quick walk away from the state capitol. Someday we'll come back and do the tour and, uh, and uh, explore the grounds and whatnot. We're about an hour and 50 minutes away from our destination, which is uh, Arrow Rock, state historic site. As we continue on the Lewis and Clark Trail, right here right here in front of the post office and courthouse. This is where we're staying today, Arrow Rock State Historic Site. Let's go for a little hike. Here we are, Arrow Rock State Park. Kind of marginal internet service, so yeah, I deployed uh, the old King Wi Fi uh, because I mean, potentially I could put like a, a Starlink somewhere out there, but there's too many trees, so I think that's gonna work out just fine with the, with the cell phone booster there. I have no idea how far the, the trail is, but actually I had an epiphany. I got this great idea and check it out. Right here in the back of the campground, we have a trail that potentially goes to the trail we're looking for. I also went back to get some bug spray because there's a little bit of bugs around here. This is kind of right behind the campsite. Right there on the other side is campsite pretty much yeah there are more bugs than I'm comfortable with with I just put some some bug spray on apply it some bug spray on maybe that'll work I believe that the, the river is right down there so that's probably why this is by the way supposed to be the, the, the pier of flesh Rock of Arrows, oh Pierre Flush, of course, in French, uh, the Rock of Arrows uh, Trail. Historic, going to the historic site now. Well, what is this? We're just emerging into a Maybe this was not the Pure Flesh Trail, this was just like a trail out of the campground. Could it possibly be? 
Well, the trail goes back here into the wilderness. So let's go back. And this one is marked. This one has blazes. So this is the actual trail, I guess. I'm not exactly tracking myself, but I'm kind of, you know, following along. Just another walk in the woods, huh? In case you're wondering, yes, I did bring my hiking shoes. I got I got some water too. Here we go. Okay, this is part of the Santa Fe Trail. It's a watering stop. The way we are not nearly as remote as this looks but I figured it'd be fun to do a nature trail you know get that blood pumping but here we are I mean it's, here we are by the visitor center of course the visitor center closed at 4 p.m. so we're not gonna be able to see it but maybe we can follow in the footsteps of Lewis and Clark Off-season attractions may be closed. Fine, fine. Well, we'll, we'll just do. see what's going on, right? I guess this would have been the courthouse. This is the first of many historic buildings we're gonna encounter. This was actually the county seat from 1939 to 1940. The town was founded in 1849, although there was a ferry here operating at this location as early as 1815. The name first appeared on a French map in 1732 as Pierre Afleche, Rock of Arrows. Lewis and Clark passed by on June 9, 1804. And later, in 1808, William Clark passed through the area again on his way to construct Fort Osage, and he thought the area would make a handsome spot for a town. Yeah, I thought that they would leave me a gavel, you know, to go like, <clears throat> order. But they do have pamphlets, and thank you for visiting. Huh? All right, Shelby Log Cabin. This was originally located southwest of Arrow Rock. It was moved here to save it from destruction, as it is one of the oldest surviving buildings in Saline County, dating back to 1835. It was actually part of a larger cabin in what was known as the Shelby neighborhood. Oh, there you go. Tavern is open until 7 p.m. We might be back, but first, let's see the rest of the town. This is, by the way, the oldest continually operating restaurant west of the Mississippi. Pretty cool. The town, very quiet. I mean, it is a weekday in the off season, and I don't really feel like doing a lot of historical exploration today. I think I am mainly going to do part of the Lewis and Clark Trail of Discovery and call it a day. It is actually late afternoon. It is closed. Let's speak through the window. All right, there you go. There.
there should be a trailhead here that goes down to the river part of the Lewis and Clark Trail of Discovery I think this is it historic river landing trail All right This is the first written description of the Missouri River. Okay, maybe muddy or flooded. <laughs> Crescent River course, oh, I see. So this would have been on the water, right? There it is, once again the mighty Missouri. Lots and lots of driftwood coming down the river, which would have been a great danger to navigation. Very nice. You can only hear the sounds of nature back here, but it is time to head back. It is time to head back. Okay, the Lewis and Clark Trail continues that way, but we're gonna take the trail back to town. <sighs> I feel like going a different route this way, going back. I'm not gonna take the trail, I'm just gonna take the park drive, which seems to be fine. No cell phone signal, I was trying to get walking directions, but driving is 0.4 miles so I'm just gonna follow follow the road and we're almost back by the way this campground 50 amp most of the sites which is good only electric there's some water spigots here and there and uh, yeah 50 amps and a lot of vacant sites that you can have you know first come first serve we made a reservation there we go 12,000 steps, goal complete. We're back. I know, this one was a little long, but we had a lot of ground to cover. Now on the next one, we're going to visit the great city in the middle of the country, Kansas City. But that will be the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching. And see you on the road. I'm riding, riding in my RV. I 